we are celebrating the season of Advent. And that word Advent, of course, means coming. There are many preparations that we have during this time of the year. I'm sure that you had at least some preparation for Thanksgiving. Uh, now we're in the midst of preparing for Christmas to come. Perhaps you've done some gift shopping or uh, meal preparation in anticipation of uh, family and friends. But maybe that has been a little subdued during the pandemic that's going around. And maybe that's not all that bad because we have a far more important preparation during this season, and that is preparing our hearts and minds for the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the main theme of this evening, it boils down to one word, and that is prepare. And we want to prepare for the entrance of our King by singing the first hymn, The Advent of Our King. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God, who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has, uh, forgives all of our sins by the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live, to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. All taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are up our hearts, O Lord, to prepare the way for your only Son. By his coming, give us strength in, the, in our conflicts and shed light on our path through the darkness of this world. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. 
Congregation may be seated. The first lesson for the day is recorded for us in the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 40. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling, In the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. I said, what shall I cry? All people are like grass, and all their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. You who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power, and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those who have young. The word of the Lord. The second lesson is recorded for us by the Apostle Peter in his second general letter, chapter 3. Do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and peace with him. These are the words of God. Congregation may rise for the words and works of our Lord. The gospel reading will also serve for the sermon text this, this afternoon. And that gospel is recorded for us in Mark chapter 1. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Jordanian countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, 
but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. We continue with a hymn of comfort, 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 all my people. Grace, mercy, and peace be yours in abundance through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, who came to be born as a baby in Bethlehem. The portion of God's word for our consideration this afternoon is recorded for us in Mark chapter 1 that was previously read as the gospel reading. Dear fellow sinners and saints, there is an ancient prophecy that the Jews still consider very important. The prophecy came about about 400 years before Jesus was born. The prophecy says that there would be another Elijah that would come. Elijah the first, he had a difficult ministry. His was to bring the king and queen, and all of Israel to repentance. It wasn't an easy task. He was burdened by it. And yet he proclaimed that, uh, that message boldly and with great courage. The Old Testament in uh, 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 8, talks about the clothing of this Elijah. And it says that he wore camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. Especially in Malachi chapter 4, we hear the prophecy of this second Elijah coming. That, were, that was the, the last prophecy of the Old Testament from the last prophet, the prophet Malachi. And he prophesied that this second Elijah would come. You know what's really interesting is that the very last words of the Old Testament are linked with the very, very first words of the Gospel of Mark that you heard as the Gospel reading this evening. And both talk about the coming of this second Elijah. 
when John the Baptist was born, his father, Zechariah, said that he was going to come in the spirit and power of Elijah. And so it was. He came in the wilderness. And it also mentions his clothing. He came wearing camel's hair, uh, a clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, just as the first Elijah came. It also mentions his diet. He ate locusts and wild honey. But what was most important was his message. And his message had to do with a spiritual ex excavation. Now, we know as we travel the interstate that the constructors of that interstate wanted to make the way smooth. And so they would um, fill up some valleys or some low places with either dirt or a bridge. And then they would cut into the mountain or the hills also. Now, as we go west, it becomes more apparent, like western Wisconsin has more hills than we do in the Manitowoc area. And so it's, it's more apparent that they cut the sides of the hills down or they even blast through those hills and they have more bridges that go over the valley. And if you go even farther west to the Rocky Mountains, it becomes even more apparent. They had to do this even more that, uh, that they would blast into mountains and hills and raise up the valleys. Well, John the Baptist came and he was to prepare the way for the Lord by telling people to do that very same thing in their spiritual lives. He wanted them to, to raise up the valleys of their lives. And who was it that came to John the Baptist with some hunger and thirst after righteousness? Wasn't it the social rejects of the day? Those people who had really no social standing, no respect in the community, the prostitutes and the tax collectors and the renowned sinners, they came to John the Baptist because John the Baptist was giving them hope. He was giving them comfort. On the other hand, there were those that were very highly exalted in their own mind the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. To them, he wanted to break down their pride. And he scolded them by calling them broods of vipers. And he asked them, who told you about the coming wrath? And then he told them to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Yes, he was doing some, some spiritual excavating there to make the way smooth for the coming of the Savior. There's a really interesting psalm that talks about making things straight and contrasting that with the crooked. It's in um, Psalm 125, verses 4 and 5. Lord, to those who are good, to those who are upright, literally straight in heart, and those, uh, but those who are uh, turned to crooked ways, the Lord will banish with evildoers. You know, the word crooked, iniquity, really means the word twisted in its original language. And you know, we have that too, don't we? So I'm asking you this evening, or if you're watching us on the internet is to do some spiritual excavating of your life too. How about those valleys? Sometimes we face the solutions of life with out thinking that God is in control or trusting him. Sometimes we, uh, we go through a whole day maybe with neglecting to pray for solutions or to praise him, to thank him for the, his goodness. 
Or sometimes we really get down because we might be holding resentment in our hearts and that anger comes out with those who really we shouldn't be angry with. Or the secret sins that are there that we like to just cover up. Then they come out in bad moods. Those are the valleys of our lives and build those up with hope as we confess our sins. But there are also times when we, um, when we have proud times too, isn't that right? When we think, we think that we're okay all by ourselves. When we don't think God has the solutions for us. Pride sometimes comes when we resist confessing our sins. Has it happened to you that at the end of the day, you know that you should be confessing your sins, but you can't think of a single sin that you committed? But there's some reasons for that. It could be pride, that we don't think that we sin all that much. Or it could be just spiritual blindness, that we really don't understand how sinful we, we really are. Or it just simply could be ignorance, that we just don't understand or we don't point to those sins that we know that we commit. And in that way we need to humble ourselves. We know that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all righteousness. On the other hand, in pride, we hear if someone thinks that they have no sin, they deceive themselves and the truth is not in them. John the Baptist had a way to solve that problem. And that is to those who were in the valley of, of depression, those who were the social rejects, who came confessing their sins, he would baptize them and give them hope. He baptized with water for the forgiveness of sins, we read here. Yes, and there was forgiveness because that baptism was connected with the suffering and death of Jesus. It was in view of the fact that this Messiah was going to come to suffer and die for all people's sins and then rise again on the third day. As John the Baptist came, for the forgiveness of sins. But those who rejected him, those who were too proud, they went off because they only were regarding their own goodness and thinking that was good enough to get them into heaven. John the Baptist, though, was pointed to someone who was far greater than he was. In his opening, uh, in the opening of St. Mark's Gospel, we read the purpose of why Mark wrote this Gospel in the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in the Isaiah, in Isaiah the prophet. Here we have three titles for Jesus, and that is, first of all, the name Jesus himself. God sent the angel Gabriel to both Mary and to Joseph to assure them that they would call this baby that the Virgin Mary was conceiving and eventually giving birth to as Jesus. Because the word Jesus means Savior or one who rescues. And that's exactly how his mission was described, as the Savior, as the rescuer of sinners. He's also called the Messiah. The Messiah means the anointed one. The prophets and priests and kings of the Old Testament were all anointed. They were set apart for a holy purpose and they all, all of those offices, pointed ahead to Jesus, the Messiah. In Greek, the word is Christ. It's also called the Son of God here. Wow, what a powerful name that is. 
just as Jesus was human because he had a human mother, so he was divine, he was God, because God the Father was indeed his, God, his Father. The mission that he came on and the redemption that he brought us was 100% complete when he called out from that cross, it is finished. All sins of all people of all times are all forgiven because God, you see, never does anything halfway. It's all complete. It's all perfect. And that demonstrates the gospel of Jesus Christ. All of our sins are forgiven because Jesus, the Son of God, was the Messiah. He was the Jesus, the rescuer, by removing all of our sins and placing it on himself. Yeah, John the Baptist came with the water of repentance. But then he says that also that the one who is greater than he was, the Son of God, would come with a baptism of fire. And that prophesies the coming of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost Day. Yes, just as John the Baptist was to prepare people for Jesus' first coming, so also the Holy Spirit was to prepare people for his second coming. The Holy Spirit works through the means of grace. You and I also have received that Holy Spirit through our baptisms that were uh, given to us, most of all, most of us, at least in our infancy. It's called being born again by water and the Spirit. And the Word of God that we hear as we study God's Word, as we listen to it in church and in our family devotions, as we are thinking about it and meditating on it, the Holy Spirit is preparing for us that day when He will come a second time. And it's true that this world is ripe for His second coming. All of the prophecies concerning the end of the world have now been fulfilled. The gospel is being proclaimed to all nations. And then, as Jesus said, and then the end will come. So it's really very important that we prepare our hearts and our minds for that second coming. And during this Advent season, as we are preparing for Christmas, let our top priority be... Uh, preparing for his second coming, staying close to Jesus, letting our walk with, with Christ being a strong walk that is at the top of our priorities. We need to exercise some spiritual excavation in our lives. When we feel down, when we feel depressed, come to the Lord and receive strength and courage from him. Receive hope knowing that he will make all things work out for our good, that our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us a glory that far outweighs them all. And when we think about the fact that we maybe don't need God a whole lot when we make decisions or in our daily lives, when we become proud, then we remember that we need to repent of our sins and know exactly who we are. And that is, we are sinners who deserve only God's wrath and punishment. I heard an interesting story not too long ago. President Eisenhower, and many of us remember perhaps his presidency. He used to call him Ike. Well, he was on his deathbed at Walter Reed Hospital in Washington, D.C. And he asked that uh, Billy Graham would come to see him. Now, Billy Graham was only allotted 30 minutes in order to go in and talk to President Eisenhower. And when he came out after the 30 minutes, he relayed his conversation with, uh, with President Eisenhower. I'll read that word for word so I don't miss anything. When the 30 minutes were up, 
uh, President Eisenhower asked me to stay longer and said to me, Billy, I want to, uh, you to tell me again how I can be sure of my sins, that they are forgiven, and that I am going to heaven because nothing else matters now. Then Billy Graham said, I took my New Testament and read him scriptures. I pointed out that we are not going to heaven because of our good works or because of money we've given to the church. We are going to heaven totally and completely on the basis of the merits of what Christ did on the cross. Therefore, he could rest in the comfort that Jesus paid it all. After prayer, I, President Eisenhower said, Thank you. I'm ready. Are you ready? You ready to stand before the judge of the living and the dead? It's a daily preparation. It takes priorities in life. So I urge you during this Advent season to prepare your hearts and minds for our Lord Jesus Christ. For he is indeed Jesus, the Savior, the Rescuer. He is truly the Messiah, the one that was set apart for the mission of saving mankind. And he truly is the Son of God who saved us completely without any merit or worthiness in us. To him be glory now and forever. Amen. Congregation may rise. In preparation for Christ's coming, let us uh, declare our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us come before the throne of God. Eternal Father, throughout the centuries, you repeated and affirmed your promise to send the offspring of the woman to crush the serpent's head. Through your prophets of old, you continually directed the eyes of your people to the advent of their Savior. We praise you, O Lord, for keeping your promise and sending your Son to destroy the works of the devil. As we prepare to celebrate the birth of our King, use your mighty word to shatter our pride and to rouse us up from spiritual slumber and apathy. Move us to take to heart the words of John, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. You sent your Son to redeem us from sin. Let this good news be our joy and strength. Use it to cheer the lonely, encourage the fearful, and give hope to the despairing. In these days before Christmas, Spare us from the stress of deadlines and the frenzy of commercialism. Fill our lives with the message of your peace and the music of your grace. Direct our eyes not only to the manger, but also to the skies, where we will see your Son coming again, not only as a lowly child, but as the Lord of lords. Lift up our hearts in joyful anticipation of that day. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, in your grace in your power, 
and in your glory. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation, and bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Congregation may be seated for a short video from our stewardship. Hi, I'm Pastor Norv Cook, chairman of the Spiritual Welfare Committee here at First German. And I'm standing once again next to the giving tree in our church's lobby with a reminder that we all consider how we can make use of it and help to eliminate our congregational debt. The main emphases of the Spiritual Welfare Committee are as follows. Worship, fellowship, and spiritual growth. I'd like to just share an example or two of what each of those subcommittees works on. The Worship Committee recently had a meeting to talk about what practices we've been observing during the COVID era, era for worship that we might want to continue with after that is done and after we have regular in-person worship once again. It's been a good opportunity to think about those things and to plan. The fellowship committee hasn't really been functioning much lately because of the restrictions on getting together, but if you think back to Unity Sunday in the fall of 2019, it was the fellowship committee that had a lot to do with planning that event. Spiritual growth, well, perhaps you have Notice the new slogan that's appearing on our church bulletins, our worship folders. First German, a great tradition, a greater mission. That slogan was created with spiritual growth in mind as a reminder of the great, wonderful mission we have as a congregation. God bless you all richly as once again we observe and celebrate the advent of our Savior King. Hi, my name is Ralph Schwark. Um, I'm on the, the, the Parish Planning Council. I'm the Parish Education Director, and I'm also one of the church elders. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to come and speak to you this evening. And the reason that I'm here mainly is because I want to talk about the, the debt-free Christmas tree that we've set up here in the lobby. It's an effort to raise some funding to help wipe out some of the debt that First German has accumulated over the past few years. Uh, the eventual hope is to raise at least $88,000. And, and I'm can, pleased to announce that at this point, we're at $9,950. Nine so we're, we're coming close to the $10,000 mark. And so that's a real blessing from our Lord that that he has opened up so many hearts and people in our congregation to respond to this. And hopefully by uh, Christmas time we can have the tree full of ornaments and, and probably have, may have reached our goal that we're trying to reach to help white out the, the depth of the church. Uh, the only other thing that I would say as the, as the chairman of the Parish Ed Committee, uh, with the exception of the online Sunday school, which we encourage parents to have their children be a part of. Uh, you can contact the church office about that, but the Pioneer Program and the Rock Group uh, is pretty much stagnant at the present time due to the COVID virus because uh, it's difficult for some people to be a part of those organizations uh, with the COVID virus being so rampant right now at the present time. But we hope that that will will go away after a while, 
or through vaccinations that uh, we become to the point where we can once again mingle like we used to. So uh, whether, you're, whether you're online or in person or just want to come anytime you want, if you would like to help us decorate our debt-free Christmas tree, it would be very much appreciated and it would be a real blessing for our church. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure talking to you. Once again, uh, good afternoon. And uh, just one announcement, and that is, uh, perhaps you've heard this, but um, uh, Mr. Josh uh, went, received a call uh, from, a divine call from the Lord to teach at uh, Michigan Lutheran Seminary uh, in many of the roles that he has here, but on the secondary level. So I ask you to keep Mr. Went in your prayers uh, as he considers this call uh, to this challenging ministry. I don't know of any other announcements, except that the announcements that are on the sheet are in the lobby underneath the carving of the Lord's Supper. God bless you throughout this week and in the next week, and please be a blessing to the people around you. Thank you.